Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhu alladheena amanu, man yirtadda minkum an deenihi, fasawfa yati allahu bi qawmin, yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna, adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen, a'izzatin ala al-kafirin, yujahiduna fi sabirillah, wa la yakhafuna lawma talaim, thalika fadlu allahi yu'tihi man yasha. Allahu wasi'un alim. It is one of the most comprehensive verses in the Qur'an and it's actually one of the few verses that connects Allah's love to His letting you do da'wah, to His letting you work for this noble cause. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ O you who believe, if you turn away from this faith, Allah will bring about a people that He loves and they love Him. They are humble with the believers. They are proud with the disbelievers. They strive in the path of Allah and they do not fear the blame of the blamer. And that is the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dalika fadlullah. That's the bounty of Allah. He bestows it upon whom He wills. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses all expanse and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. I think about that verse and there are many things that you can thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. First and foremost, Alhamdulillah for giving us Islam. Alhamdulillah for giving us Islam. Alhamdulillah for giving us Iman. And we pray to Allah for Yaqeen. And Alhamdulillah for letting us be in any way a small part of the succession that is to come. And we pray that we don't disgrace ourselves and risk being replaced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to break down this verse inshallah ta'ala for a bit and hopefully leave you with something instructive. And I want to thank everyone for being a part of this and, and remind you by the way that being a part of this da'wah is not just being Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif rahimahullah and he'd be the first person to tell you that. There are many people that were around him, some of them that are in this room today. There are many people that support this work in different ways. And as Dr. Nazar was speaking earlier about the capacities, the spiritual arzaq, the risk, the sustenance that Allah gives us in terms of how he divided the a'mal, how he divided good deeds. Don't belittle your place in this community and in the work of this deen. Your position is important. Every single person has something to contribute to this beautiful message and to exert themselves. When we talk about this verse, Allah will bring about a people. That is to show you that if Allah chooses to let you be a part of this, then that is the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. If Allah Azza wa Jal replaces you, that is your loss, even if you don't have as much of a burden in terms of carrying this message and moving it forward. But everyone wants to be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that description, yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. Allah loves them and they love Allah. You know, if you were a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you had a pretty good idea about where you stood in the hierarchy of believers. But when the Prophet ﷺ comes out the day before Khaybar and says, tomorrow I'm going to give this, this flag, this banner to someone who loves Allah and His Messenger and someone who Allah and His Messenger love. And all of the Sahaba are competing to hope to be that person. And everyone wants to have their name announced, not so that they can have the glory of carrying victory when they come out of Khaybar not to have the spoils of war, nor the celebration of their colleagues and companions, but to fit the description that the Prophet ﷺ just gave, that Allah and His Messenger love this person, and this person loves Allah and His Messenger ﷺ. And everyone was just hoping that they'd hear their name. That was the greatest prize, no matter what the sacrifice was until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced that it was Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That he was a man who loved Allah and his messenger. And Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him. It makes 
everything else so irrelevant. And I don't want to minimize the problems or the concerns or the other pursuits that exist in our lives because Allah did not create us as angels, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as, as human beings. And sometimes we, we want certain things as human beings. We chart out certain trajectories. But loving Allah is so different. And to be loved by Allah is so different. And Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَلَيْسَ كَحُبِّهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like him and there is nothing like his love. Allah says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like him subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَيْسَ كَحُبِّهِ شَيْءٍ And there is nothing like his love. To be loved by Allah is to have the greatest companion, the greatest comfort, the greatest protector. And it gets more and more specific as you start to go through the traits of the ayat of the Quran. And by the way, we don't credit our teachers enough and those that are pioneers. You know, when I did the series, Allah Loves, that was something that I learned from a beloved teacher of mine, Shaykh Omar al-Ashqar rahimahullah ta'ala. Some of you may know, Shaykh Omar al-Ashqar rahimahullah taught Iman, taught faith in a way that he always tried to make it practical. His Islamic creed series, some of you might have seen it. And he said, you know, we need to teach people to long for Allah. We need to teach people to long for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to long for the Day of Judgment in a way that's practical. And instead of just talking about who Allah isn't, let's talk about who Allah is. And instead of just constructing the philosophy of a God and, you know, talking about why there must be a God, Let's talk about what he's like. There's a reason why Allah gave us all these asma and sifat, to know him and then to love him and then to want to do for him. And then let's talk about all these qualities that he loves from you. Allah has his names and attributes, but he has his qualities for those that want to love him as well. As Imam Ahmed Allah said, if you want to know Allah's, your position with Allah, then look at his position with you. You want to know how Allah loves you? Look at how you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to practically do for him, and you start to see the ayat list out these different things and the ahadith, and there's always something practical. The famous hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah Azza wa Jal has said, Man adali waliya faqad adhantuhu bil harb. Whoever takes one of my awliya, one of my loved ones as an enemy, I will wage war on that person. For, for, for that person, Allah would wage war. And Dr. Nadir talked about that hadith a bit because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you don't come close to him. You don't become a wali of Allah through anything more fundamental than the fara'at, than the mandatory deeds. And there's the hadith of Jundab ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, subhanallah. Man salla subh fa huwa fi dhimmatillah. Whoever prays their fajr prayer is under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa goes on to say, it's also an authentic hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, less known, but look at the implication. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, and whoever is fi dhimmatillah, whoever is under Allah's protection. If someone tries to harm that person, Allah will throw that person face first into the fire. Because that person becomes a wali of Allah by virtue of what? Some secret ingredient? No, fajr. They kept their fajr and they observed the rites of salat al fajr. And they grew. There is no greater comforter than Allah. There is no greater confidant than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no greater protector than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to be loved by Him becomes such a great pursuit that it just minimizes everything else. To where you start to love for Him and hate for Him. You start to want for Him and not want for Him. And you start to cast everything in that. It overwhelms your senses. Not in a way that gives you some sort of spiritual ecstasy to where you feel like you're floating all the time, but in a way that you're action driven to want to hear so badly that Allah considers you amongst his awliya, that Allah considers you amongst those that he loves. So Allah gives us these measures. فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The first sign 
of your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of your belief, is the way you're treating your brothers and sisters. بينهم, merciful amongst themselves. You love your brothers and sisters. You are humble towards your brothers and sisters. And you have pride with the disbelievers. That doesn't mean that you oppress them or harm them. Because the Prophet ﷺ did not oppress and harm them, but that means that you stand your ground, your principles. Even when you're around people who don't hold that same faith, you don't shy away from what you have of this beautiful deen of Islam. You practice it proudly. You know, they say you wear it proudly, you practice it proudly in every way. You love your deen. You don't relinquish it. And you don't fear the blame of the blamer. SubhanAllah, these descriptions, I want you to think about the companions that came forth and embraced this religion and how their entire world views were shaped and their entire interactions with everyone around them were shaped. Who did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace Abu Jahl with? Sheikh Yusuf was talking about it so beautifully earlier. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And one of the narrations where the Prophet ﷺ was making dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide one of the two, Umar ibn Khattab or Abu Jahl, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma izzad Islam bi ahabbi hadhaini rajulaini ilayk. Oh Allah, give victory to Islam, to the more beloved of these two men to you. The one you love more out of these two, let them be a source of victory for Islam. Now in the moment, neither one of them look like those that were beloved to Allah or who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're both trying to kill the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most beloved person to Allah. But there is something in the heart that needed to be activated. There was some goodness to be salvaged. And the one who was more deserving of it indeed was guided. And suddenly Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu who would beat up a companion of the Prophet sallallahu for the sake of his tribe would stand in battle on behalf of those weak and meager people that were looked down upon in society would stand in battle on their behalf and fight his own tribesmen for them and then humble himself and get on his knees and take knowledge from Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was half his size and didn't have the stature or the lineage or the tribe before him and would refer to Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, our master who's been freed by our master come forward. Suddenly Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu becomes what? Adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen. Truly, adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen. So humble with the believers. But don't cross him if you're on the other side on the battlefield. Abu Jahl can walk up to Umar and say, you and I, there is no you and I. That doesn't exist anymore. We're a people of principle. And the entire time, look at Umar ibn Khattab anhu entering into Jerusalem. This is the generation of the Quran. Not afraid of the blame of others, not afraid of what they will say. We are a people who are given their honor through Islam. And when we seek it through anything else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliates us. Look at Salman al Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They strive in the path of Allah. Salman did not fear the blame of his father. He didn't fear the blame of the Persians. He didn't fear the blame of the Syrian Christians when he went there. He didn't fear the blame of the Arabs in Al-Hijaz. He didn't fear the blame of anybody. Because Allah chose him. He loved Allah and Allah loved him. You see, this love that you have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to reshape everything. And because I want to end with something practical for us to take, because introspection, a tadabbur wa tafakkur wal i'tibar, actually thinking and reflecting a bit, you'll derive answers for yourself that no one else can derive for you in a speech or a halaqa. We just finished the lecture on Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu this past Tuesday. Such a thoughtful man, a zahad, the ascetic of the Ansar, the scholar of the Ansar. And he asked his wife, what was his ibadah? She said his ibadah was tafakkur. He would sit and he would think and contemplate for an hour. Take time and think and contemplate. When the Prophet ﷺ said, Ittaqullaha haythuma kunt. 
Fear Allah wherever you are. Be mindful of Allah wherever you are. Usually the word taqwa is used in the capacity of what? Do not violate. Do not violate the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when you are in a position to easily and readily do so. And you need taqwa as a foundation. And so you ask yourself when you're in business, when you're in a business transaction, well, you don't need the fatwa half the time. Not that there isn't financial regulations, but you know, when someone comes up to me and asks me a question about some financial thing, I can tell you already know it's haram before you ask the question. You sound guilty, right? You ask yourself, what does taqwa look like here? What does consciousness of Allah look like? When you come to your imam and you got a family issue and you want to talk about husband and wife and their rights versus your rights, the Prophet ﷺ said, اتَّقُوا فِيهِمْ Be mindful of Allah with the people in your household. What does taqwa look like? What does not taking advantage of the situation look like in this family dynamic? Before I go to the shaykh and start to, you know, divide halal and haram and who owes who what and who treats who what, what's taqwa look like? I fear Allah in how I deal with the people in my household. I fear Allah with how I deal with the people that are at my mercy. I fear Allah with how I deal with people in my business dealings. I fear Allah with how I deal with people with my tongue. What does it look like to not transgress that? Because tarakna nisf al-halal, we left off half of halal out of fear of the haram. We don't want to go anywhere near that. Then that next daraja, that next level, is when you actually examine in every single situation in your life and say, what does it look like to love Allah right now? I, I want you to actually pause. You know, subhanAllah, there are times we don't know how to pause. That's actually one of the problems. Hasty, the ajala, hasty speech, hasty action. You know, the beautiful quality so that the Prophet ﷺ said that we're so loved by Al Ashaj ibn Qais, Hilm and Ana, forbearance and pause, being calculated. When you pause in a situation, say, What does it mean to love Allah right now? What does it mean to love Allah when I'm in this compromising situation? What does it mean to love Allah when I'm not in this compromising situation? What does it mean to love Allah when people are around? What does it mean to love Allah when it's just me in the privacy of my home and it's nighttime and it's 4 a.m. and I see the clock and I say, what does it mean to love Allah right now? What does it mean to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you see one of your family members or one of your friends going through something and you could easily turn away what does it mean to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when your desires are becoming overpowering? And you say, I love Allah more than I love myself. And I love to please Allah more than I love to please myself. What does it mean to love Allah when there are people around you who don't love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When you're able to pause and say, what does it mean to fear Allah right now? So that I don't violate anyone's rights and then say, what does it mean to love Allah right now? Because that has to reshape every single worldview and every single worldly interaction. What was the secret ingredient of the Sahaba in all of these different situations? Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim, al ladina an'am Allahu alayhim. They're the generation, those that Allah is pleased with. What was their secret? That they always loved Allah more than anyone else loved anything or anyone else. Because لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَلَيْسَ كَحُبِّهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like Allah's love. And so they were able to outlast their enemies in battle because they outloved. They loved Allah more. They were able to outwork those that planned against them despite their smaller numbers because they outloved. You think those people that love their da'wah love their da'wah more than we love our da'wah? You think they hate Islam more than we love Islam? You think they hate our Prophet ﷺ more than we love our Prophet ﷺ? Can't be the case. And so I leave you with that verse. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادَ يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ From those who have taken partners besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love those things, they love those people, the way that they should love Allah. But you know what? Those who believe love Allah so much more than they love whatever it is that they love. Your brothers and sisters, my request for you with everything that you've learned today is to sit with it for a bit. 
I want you to sit with yourself, inshallah ta'ala, at some point tonight, maybe sit with each other as a family and say, what do we take from all of this? What's one thing that I'm going to change about my life? What does it mean to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these situations? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that are beloved to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who love to be loved by Him more than anything else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for any of our shortcomings and protect us from disqualifying ourselves from His love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make beloved to us every action that brings us closer to His love. And may Allah put in our hearts the love of those that are beloved to Him and at the top of them Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, His most beloved. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to resemble the beloved one sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our lives, in every single facet of our lives, until we are joined in love with the one that we love most for his sake, our beloved one sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-firdaus al-a'la, Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khayran to all of you for coming here today and spending the day with us. I pray that you found benefit in it. I hope that I get to meet all of you inshallah ta'ala. I know we're gonna try to arrange logistically for something to happen right now inshallah. But I want to ask you to first and foremost thank the volunteers on your way out. If one of them, you know, got a little rough or was taken aback or was getting paranoid or panicking because they're trying to organize, it's not easy to organize this crowd and organize these events. So please on your way out, just say Jazakumullahu khaira and forgive them if they made you feel a certain way. And may Allah reward you all.